afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Nidhi. You can continue. Okay. Uh, is my slide visible? Slides are not visible. Yeah, now it is visible, visible. Okay. So this was an interesting case. Actually, it was diagnosed. It had uh, interesting histology and was diagnosed on autopsy. So that is why I got this. It is an interesting case for learning purposes. This was a patient who came to PGI in 2019 but was being evaluated outside for a left lung mass since 2016. This was a 2016 chest X-ray of the patient which showed a homogeneous mass in the left mid zone. And uh, this, uh, in addition, the patient had some inhomogeneous opacity in the left lower zone showing air program. So this patient was evaluated outside, did not have fever, but uh, the, they uh, undertook endobronchial biopsy of the patient which showed dilation tissue. And because of the patient's ESR were raised, the patient was given treatment for tuberculosis. The exact details were not available with the patient. So this patient came to us in 2019. So now the, he, we saw his chest x-ray. His chest x-ray showed that mass and the rest of the lungs were clear. This lung lesion had marginally increased in three years. Approximately one centimeter increased in last three years. And the patient now had primary complaint of abdominal pain, jaundice, and he had shortness of breath for the last two days. And another complaint, he was a progressive body swelling was there in the patient. So to evaluate all these symptoms, the patient underwent CCD. So these are the CCD chest sections, the mediastinal window. There was no mediastinal lymphadenopathy. There was minimal pericardial effusion, mini minimal pleural effusion, and notice made of a hyperdense dense radiole in the left lobe of thyroid. This is the mass which was better seen on these CCT chest images. You can see a well-defined, lobulated, homogeneous mass. There was no necrosis, no fat, and no calcification in this mass. And as you can see on this uh, thing that uh, it is a uh, lung window, minip sections, that it was abutting bronchial bifurcation. It was abutting the bronchial bifurcation, but there was no, uh, uh, there was no cutoff, only narrowing. These are chest window sections. You can see there are there's atelectasis surrounding the lung. The rest of the lung parenchyma is grossly normal. The abdominal sections showed liver enlarged, the spleen was enlarged. There was no lymphadenopathy. There was also no lymphadenopathy in the metastinum and no lymphadenopathy in the abdomen. There was no lesion in the liver. There was no lesion in the spleen. That is no focal lesion. However, there was diffuse fat stranding in the subcutaneous planes as well as the abdominal fat. So this is the corner sections. You can see the liver is grossly enlarged, the spleen is enlarged. And bilateral kidneys were also enlarged. No focal lesion could be seen, no hyperdensity could be seen, but there was gross hepatosplenomegaly and renomegaly. So what on radiology we had was a mass in the left upper lobe with associated enlarged bilateral kidneys, enlarged liver, enlarged spleen, and minimal left pleural and pericardial effusion, which was possibly because of the renal uh, um, involvement of the lesion. So we had multi-system involvement, that is pulmonary, renal, liver, and spleen. Uh, the clinical workup was done, which is important. Uh, we need a radiological clinical correlation to finally come at the diagnosis. So the, a lot of investigations were undertaken, but the most significant ones showed urine blood tests, which revealed nephrotic syndrome. The patient had excessive proteins in the urine. And the most important is that the patient's liver biopsy showed Congo red and apple green bifringens that are indicative, indicative of amyloidosis. So basically, the amyloidosis deposition was there in the liver, in the spleen and the kidneys and they are consistent with the radiological findings. But what they could not make out was okay, what was the amyloid protein, whether it was amyloid A or kappa or lambda line chains. So that was inconclusive. So they were not able to make out whether it is primary or secondary. So we are sure that the patient has systemic amyloidosis. So we had a group discussion, the patient has systemic amyloidosis, liver, spleen, a lot of organs are involved. But what is the cause, whether it is primary or secondary? Now, the differentials that we could think of was maybe it is primary and the lung lesion is a lung amyloidoma, which lung amyloidosis can be nodular or septal. Nodular amyloidosis has been put in more commonly, but you see multiple nodules with calcification. So this is unusual, but can fit into the picture. Then we had lung tuberculoma. The patient, it does not fit into lung tuberculosis. There are no fibrosis, no changes of tuberculosis, but uh, the granulation tissue was seen in the biopsy. So considering that another differential was this. And another differential was secondary systemic myelidosis, secondary to benign or lung malignant arthritis. 
uh, there are no such case reports of, of systemic amyloidosis taken through a benign lung neoplasm. Malign malignant lung neoplasms are known, but in this patient, the lung mass had grown only to a centimeter in three years. So there was, it was obviously a dilemma, what to do next. So intervention radiology was planned for the patient. He, uh, we will plan FNSU biopsy. And last is that maybe they were unrelated. Maybe the lung neoplasm was unrelated to the primary systemic amyloidosis of the patient. So in our center, because the uh, patient had liver failure and had severe coagulopathy, we could not do any biopsy of the patient. So uh, patient was very sick. So primary thinking of primary systemic amyloidosis, a treatment was started. The hemodialysis was given for the renal failure. However, the patient had cardiac arrest and he expired, unfortunately. And uh, But uh, what was interesting was the autopsy diagnosis. And it is a learning case for uh, future also. Uh, this was a patient of a low-grade mucoepidermoid cast of the lung, which led to secondary systemic amyloidosis. There, it is known that carcinoma can lead to secondary systemic amyloidosis. Very rare. Only about 20 cases reported till now. But uh, because a lung carcinoma has a very low growth rate, sorry, fast growth rate, so it does not lead to amyloidosis. But a low-grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma, because it was growing so slowly, it, had, it led to systemic amyloidosis in this patient. And that was the major cause of morbidity and mortality for this patient. So, in short, just about the mucoepidermoid carcinoma of the lung, there are two main types of slightly gland tumors, mucoepidermoid carcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma. They can be low-grade or high-grade. And the low-grade ones are normally seen in the patients in their 30s and 40s, like this patient was 42 years old when he presented to us. Low grade, imaging findings are low grade ones are the ones with the central and they show moderate to marked enhancement and especially they are seen at bronchial bifurcation site similar to our case and the high grade ones are the ones which are seen in periphery and they are similar to any other lung tumor but they, the low grade malignant tumors have to be differentiated uh, which are mucoepidermoid carcinomas, adenoid cystic carcinoma and bronchial carcinoid it is very difficult to differentiate on imaging wise bronchial carcinoid tumor versus mucoepidermoid carcinoma, except for the fact that the calcification in mucoepidermoid carcinoma is, if it's present, it is present with, along with cystic changes. While adenoid cystic carcinoma, it is normally involves the main trachea and the bronchus, it is less commonly seen in the hyla. So the interesting case about this was that this mucoepidermoid carcinoma had led to secondary amyloidosis. I checked the literature and only one case has been reported till now, that was in pediatric radiology, reported in 2001. And they also were skeptical that whether it was incidental or it was the cause. But our autopsy showed the deposition of mucoepidermoid carcinoma clearly and the deposition of myeloid A proteins diffusely in all the organs of the body of the male patient. And other lung cancers which can be associated with uh, myeloidosis are epidermoid lung cancer, wood cell lung cancer, bronchialveolar carcinoma. So this is the second case that I've come across besides this case report of mucoepidermoid carcinoma leading to secondary myeloidosis. Thank you. Interesting case, Nidhi. Uh, it was uh, really an interesting case. Yeah. Uh, if uh, this patient actually died because of, not because of basically, yeah, yeah, yeah mucopidomide, but it died because, mainly because of amylo, amyloidosis. Yeah. In fact, uh, mucopidomide didn't even lead to lymphoma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that and it was amyloidosis, which was the cause of the yeah. failure. And the learning point is that it would have we would have resected or it have been resected on time. And uh, in time, the patient would not have uh, would have survived. So I have a the question is what not the bone marrow findings. Bone marrow uh, bone marrow was done. It re revealed about eight percent plasma cells. So uh, it was problematic. They were not sure it is primary systemic. Uh, that is. Uh, related to multiple myeloma or papilla. I mean, they were not uh, sure still whether after the bone marrow also, whether it was primary or secondary. So that was a problem. If they would have come to the secondary, we would have removed the cause. And no, the patient had a fast deterioration actually. The clinical deterioration was very fast. Yeah, have they done uh, the bone marrow evaluation on autopsy? Uh, it must be done in PGA. Uh, actually, I don't uh, know the exact uh, this thing. Uh, what was the bone marrow findings? I just knew the final diagnosis on autopsy. Because the uh, association of mucoperdermoid with the secondary amyloidosis is very rare. You have to you have to exclude. 
to exclude all Actually, other no. possibilities. Uh, they were uh, like pretty sure because uh, the uh, myeloid deposition is normally primary systemic myelodosis. You get the AL proteins deposition, while secondary you get the AA proteins. So there was a difference in the myeloid structure that they found. And uh, yes, you are right that you have to move out. Maybe it was incidental, but uh, there's already one case report about it. This is the second one. So, and the way it progressed, 2016 it presented with mass and 2019 with nephrotic syndrome. So there's a pause, positive and link timing correlation. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thank you, thank you for this opportunity.